Hi, this is Emma Bell and welcome to the Inside Shift podcast. Welcome to the Inside Shift and today we have Paul Hannum as a guest. Paul has over 25 years of experience in organisational psychology and personal development. His insights are based on expertise in the theory and more importantly the practice of high performance. He taught at Oxford University and has three books published. He has also coached over 10,000 employees around the world and founded and built a major training and recruitment business. Paul's new book on the psychology of engagement is called The Wisdom of Groundhog Day and was number one for self-help on Amazon. On the I Perform program, Paul provides the proven tools and practices to help you feel and perform at your best every day. Paul Hannon, welcome to the Inside Shift podcast. Well, thank you, Emma. It's great to be here. Lovely to have you. We normally start off our podcast by asking a guest to share with us the most impactful inside shift that they've ever made in their own life. So we're dying to hear yours. <laughs> well, for me, it was um, really what seemed at first like a disastrous series of events that took place about six or seven years ago. But just to step back from that, I lived in England till my late 40s. And in 2006, I moved to California with my family. And everything had gone swimmingly up to then. You know, I had a very successful business. I taught at Oxford, just published my first book. And I never needed to work again. You know, we bought a large house near the Pacific Ocean. And I spent my time playing tennis, walking on the beach, reading by the pool. Sounded perfect. But then it all went terribly wrong. Um, a series of events took place. Um, Basically, the great crash of 2008 in the States was far worse than it was in the UK. Um, house prices went down in our area by around about 50%. I'd set up three environmental businesses, which all failed in a row because nobody was interested in the environment at this stage because the economy was on the verge of complete collapse. And then I went through a divorce. So having flown out in uh, first class in 2006, I flew back... Um, feeling very sorry for myself in 2011 in economy class and really quite devastated. It felt like my life had fallen apart. I'd lost, lost almost all of my money. Uh, businesses had failed and I'd gone through this very difficult divorce. I was suffering from acute anxiety and I really felt quite worthless. And what I discovered was my whole sense of self, my whole sense of identity had collapsed around me. And the reason had been because I'd linked my whole identity to my accomplishments and to achievements. And that's a terrible way to set up your life. And at first, I, I felt very sorry for myself. But then I had a conversation with a friend, and they put a very interesting thought to me. They said, what if there was a different meaning to my predicament? What if what I thought had been the worst thing had ha that had happened to me actually turned out to be a blessing in disguise? And I started to think about this, and I realized that although in my external life I had everything I'd ever wanted, I never felt right. I always felt anxious. I never really enjoyed what I'd been achieving up to then. And it was only when it was completely stripped away that I understood what was important in my life, what I now call my authentic needs. And this is what I write about in my book, that sometimes you have to lose everything to find out what's really important in your life. And as a result of this, I now base my life not on what I consume, not on what I achieve, but on enjoying life from moment to moment. I'm far happier. I'm far more balanced. I'm far healthier. You know, I'm not as successful at making money, but I feel I'm a lot more successful at making a life. And in many ways, I think I've gone on a shift from focusing all my attention on satisfying my own needs and on building my ego to building a life now where I'm trying to satisfy my authentic needs, my need for peace of mind, for happiness, for meaning, for purpose, and also trying to serve other people as well. And I think this is probably the most important shift in my life. Uh, I mean, that, that's a significant shift. I'm wondering, Paul, whether that shift happened shortly after your conversation with your friend in one huge transition or whether the shift was made up of a series of smaller insights bit by bit into the lessons that you tell us you've learned? Well, it's a great question. And for me, it triggered off a chain reaction of, of smaller insights. What I found is that 
one of the challenges in life is we often can read a book or somebody can say something and we'll be very affected by it at the moment, but then it sort of slips away and we revert to our default state. But what happened with me after this conversation was I really dwelled on it. I, I wrote about it in my journal and I started to practice thinking about how I could be happy, how I could be calm, how I could make sense of what had happened. And each day, I look to make small adjustments in my life. And this is why I wrote, you know, the book about Groundhog Day. Because Groundhog Day is the story of somebody who makes small changes every day to make a profound shift in their lives. And that worked for me. So whereas other people, I think, have had that sort of road to Damascus experience, and despite being called Paul, it was uh, it, it happened a lot longer than just one epiphany. Um, so it's really been continuous practice. I think it's more of a shift in direction. And I'm still very much a work in progress, but I feel I'm heading in the right direction now. And um, what do you see as the most important aspects of authenticity for you? It's it's a topic that's really dear to my heart. That I'm interested in what you believe are the most important aspects of authenticity. Well, I think again, it's a, it's a complex question, but it's such an important one for me. It's really trying to strip back my conditioning. And by that, I mean to really think, who am I beyond what my parents expected from me, what my school wanted from me, what my friends did or didn't do, my, my seeking for approval, for control, and trying to cut through, through mindfulness, to really get to the core of who I am. Um, I call this, um, in this term an, our authentic selves. Who are we beyond all our conditioning? And that's a tough one, and it's not something which happened to me overnight. But what I believe is all authentic is when I act from a sense of love and meaning and purpose, and I don't act from the need to impress people or gain people's approval or out of fear or anxiety, which would really characterize so much of my life up to then. And it, it's seen beyond those sort of impulsive, reaction, reactive um, behaviors that we all have. So I'm still working on that. And I think we have to find our own core self. And sometimes it changes when we're in a low mood. We tend to revert back to that fear and anxiety. But if we focus on staying healthy, on staying mindful, and really relaxing, being calm, I believe there is a, a voice within us that starts to speak to us. And the key is to really listen to and discern that voice. Mm. And that's something I focus on every day. And I was, I'm keen to understand a little bit more about the role that mindfulness plays in your life. You've mentioned it a couple of times and, and in particular, whether you have a mindfulness practice that you follow. I do very much. For me, um, I do formal meditation of two 20 minute sessions a day. But for me, the most powerful form of mindfulness is walking. I've walked my whole life. My, my parents didn't have a car, and walking was a huge part of my life as I grew up. And then I lost sight of that when I was building my businesses. But over the last five years, I've now got back to walking five or six miles a day. Now, not everybody can do that. But for me, when I'm out walking, I don't have the phone on or I don't engage in, in uh, conversations. I have put all my energy into experiencing my surroundings. So I listen to the songbirds, I watch leaves falling from a tree, I look at the clouds moving in the sky, I feel the wind on my face, I absorb myself into nature, I try and reconnect with nature, which is so important to my well-being, and I feel something that we've all lost so much in our society is, you know, we live our lives in boxes, in our houses, in our cars, in trains, in offices, and for me, going out and touching nature and being part of nature is the key for me to mindfulness. So mindfulness is not just about that formal meditation where you're sitting and, um, you know, maybe repeating a mantra or doing a breathing technique. It's a way of mind that allows you to experience life as it happens and to savor each moment. It's a way of improving the quality of every moment, even if you can't change your circumstances. I love that phrase, Paul, that you've just used. It's a way of experiencing life as it happens. And whilst I agree with you, being in nature is uh, it's a very connective environment to be in, even though being in your car when you're stopped yeah. at a red light allows you to experience life as it happens. 
So true. Well, one of the most interesting pieces of research um, over the last few years was carried out um, at Harvard into this idea of mindfulness as opposed to mind wandering. Mind wandering is when we're sitting in that car and we're thinking about, oh, we're going to be late or we should be doing this, we have to do this, and our mind's all over the place. Even if we're thinking about positive things, we're not present. Whereas mindfulness is when you're present. And this research at Harvard using thousands of... Um, people involved in this study using an app, what it discovered was that people are far happier in a traffic jam where they're being present than if they're doing a job they're enjoying where their mind is wandering. And I think this is a transformative discovery because what it says is the fastest way and the most consistent way to be happy is to be mindful, is to be in the moment, even if you're stuck in a traffic jam. So happiness is when we're being mindful unhappiness is when we're mind wandering and we're mm. focused on the past or the future and so it, mindfulness as you say it doesn't you don't have to just be walking in beautiful countryside you could be in a train you could be in a car you could be with people you don't particularly like but it's that presence that you carry with you at all times so in short happiness joy can really only be found in the present moment i th I wouldn't necessarily even say only, but I think that's the root. And mm. I think where we've gone so wrong as a society is seeking happiness in change, in changing our circumstances, you know, going on holiday and getting more possessions, all the things I did for 25 years and I became an expert in, but discovered actually they did not lead to happiness. They can lead to short-term pleasure, but in terms of long-term deep, profound sense of well-being, I believe we have to be in the present moment and we can't keep on looking outside of ourselves to find happiness by trying to change our circumstances, which again is the story of, of, um, of Groundhog Day, that somebody who can't change his circumstances at all learns to change his mindset. That's what, you know, to use your terms, Emma, is the inside shift. Mm. And so happiness is a clear benefit of mindfulness. Are there any other benefits that you, that, that accrue to you from mindfulness? Almost definitely. Um, there's a sense of calm. I mean, you can measure it. You can measure your blood pressure. You can measure your pulse. You know, there's been a huge number of studies into the health benefits of being mindful. I also think it makes you a better listener. It makes you better with other people because when you're really present with people, you're giving them what they want. Most of the time we're trying to fix people's problems or we're thinking about what we want to say next or even if we're going to how, how we're going to argue with them, help them, you know, we're, it's all about us. But when you're mindful with another person and you really listen to them with all your body, all your presence, that is the, act, the greatest act of kindness I believe you can do for somebody else because it allows them to be themselves and to talk and say what's really important, rather than feeling that you always want to jump in in the conversation. I couldn't agree more with you, Paul. I, I think something happens in that interaction as well. It creates a safe space. It's almost as if there's a connection that would be absent if you weren't listening with such presence. It's a real gift, isn't it? Oh, most definitely. Because we're so um, fixated on our mind, on our thinking, on our feelings, um, I think we miss out on whole other areas of communicating. But, you know, when, we, when we're present with ourselves, there is almost another field of communication that's taking place. And you can feel it. You know, we all have that sixth sense, that intuition, but we really like someone and we can't always say why. But it's often not what they say, it's the way they say it and it's the their quality of their presence with us. Mm. Now, I mean, your story is, is quite incredible and, and what I've taken from what you've told me is a number of things, one of which is that we can be happier regardless of our outside circumstances. Is that something you agree with? And, and if so, how would you advise our listeners to move in that direction? Oh, very much so. I mean, in my professional life, I do a lot of work in what's called employee engagement. And one of the ideas I work in is that if you had 50 people, or even say 10 people doing exactly the same job in exactly the same organization, you'd have a whole range of experiences. Some people would hate it, some people would love it, and some people would be somewhere in the middle. And what's happening? Why is 
the experience so different. And for me, it's about the quality of attention, the quality of mindfulness you bring to what you're doing. And that's what I mean by improving the quality of your life without changing your circumstances. When we're doing a job, when we're in a relationship, when we're you know, living in a certain place and we suddenly feel bad, we feel unhappy, our first reaction is to want to change it. If only I had a better job, if only I was with somebody different, then I'd be happier. And we, we tend to look to escape from our feelings. What mindfulness does is allow you to really observe your feelings and just, just let them go and observe yourself and, if you like, move to a different level and notice that you can actually shift the way you feel about something and that you have this extraordinary gift within you to change your mindset about what's happening. You know, it's interesting, I just to illustrate this and coming back to walking, there's a park I've been to my whole life and I've done virtually the same walk since being a toddler and I noticed that when I was a toddler and I did that walk I loved being immersed in nature you know I was just there present having fun then as a seven-year-old all I was thinking about was the ice cream at the end of the walk with my parents I wasn't interested in the walk I just wanted the ice cream as a 12 year old I went with my friends and played football and all that mattered was my friends then I did the same walk at 18 with my first girlfriend and all that mattered was my girlfriend but as a 30-year-old with my children, all that mattered was my family. As a 40-year-old, I was on the phone. All that mattered was my business. And now I go back and try and experience that park as I did as a toddler again mm. and immerse myself. The point I'm making is that we bring our state of mind, our perspective to everything that we do. And the exact same walk, I chose to see it in multiple ways. And we all do this. You know, Groundhog Day is about somebody who's trapped forever in the same town, the same place and time, the same day. But we're all trapped at some levels and we trap ourselves. You know, about 90% of what we think today will be the same as yesterday and the same as tomorrow. But we can change the way we think. We can change our experience of the exact same walk, the exact same person, meeting, commute, whatever it is we do. And I loved um, the wisdom of Groundhog Day, and and for me, it spoke to me a lot about choice, about exercising conscious choice, mm. in in every situation. And some of what you're saying connects with me again on that level of choice. Is there? And I I know perhaps it's the same message put in a different way, but I think some people can hear one message put in one way, but others can't. So would you be able to? reposition this from the perspective of choice. Very much so. Um, I mean, Groundhog Day is a wonderful film that's loved by millions, one of the most popular films ever made. And it, But it's about a man played by Bill Murray called Phil Connors who's trapped forever in the same day. And he goes through every possible response to being trapped and he shifts his mindset dramatically. Now the genius of the movie, Emma, is that nothing changes outside of himself. The mm. only thing that can change is himself. So all the focus, all the spotlight is on how he changes. And that's one of the big life lessons that comes out of this movie. And there's a moment in the middle of a film that changes everything. His, um, his future girlfriend, Rita, played by Andy McDowell, offers a complete radical shift in his way of thinking when, when she says to him, maybe being trapped in time is not a curse. It just depends on how you look at it. Mm. And this leads to a profound shift. He shifts from anger and denial to to really helping people. He moves from helping himself to helping other people, from disconnection to connection, from despair to love. And he gets there through daily experimentation, through continuous trial and error. He builds this amazing life. And he tries every possible philosophy, every possible way of living in this time trap over decades in the same day. And he eventually finds this way of living that brings him profound happiness, calm, and fulfillment, and love. And that same option is available to all of us. When we treat each day almost as a separate life, and when we wake up and we think, how can I change the way I think, the way I feel, the way I act today? What can I do differently from yesterday to make today better? Mm. And if we live that life almost as an experiment, it's amazing what we can achieve. I love that idea, Paul, of living each day as if it were a different life. And 
What I've heard you say is that we have to take responsibility for living each day as if it were a different life and know that we can make a choice about to, to shift our mindset and how to shift our mindset. And I talk about the one degree shift, the analogy being a ship. And, and even if we just shift our mindset by one degree, that could give us a completely different perspective on our relationship, on our environment, when nothing has apparently changed on the outside. That's so true. I mean, again, in my professional work, I do quite a bit of work with Olympic athletes and with, with high performers, less, less so at the moment, but certainly over the last few years. And all of their focus goes into making tiny micro changes every day to their diet, to their performance, to their flexibility, to their strategies. And that can lead eventually to Olympic success. But why not apply the same logic, the same sense of practice to practicing how to be happy? practicing how to be calm, how to be fulfilled, how to be a better person, you know, how to be a better husband, wife, father, child. Why do we stop? Why do we only think of practice in terms of exams or learning how to play golf or drive a car? Why don't we practice the really important stuff in life, which is being happy? And, you know, for me, practice is the key. And again, a key theme from the movie is he doesn't change by reading books or listening to empowering talks or going on workshops. He changes by actually getting out there and doing it, by making changes. You know, knowledge is not action. And it's by taking action on this consistent day, just as you described, consistent daily basis, that miracles occur. Mm. And I love this idea that we could have a gold medal for being happy. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> We could win a gold medal by consistently taking action and practicing on a daily basis to make the inside shift. Well, that's so true because one of the great discoveries of, um, of psychology over recent years in a field called positive psychology, which is the study of happiness, is that if you, there are three big factors in terms of our happiness. Round about half of our happiness is genetic. Some people are just born happier or their conditioning makes them happier. Then about 10% of our happiness is down to our circumstances, which is, you know, our, our standard of living, our relationships, our work, all the things we normally look to happiness. But this is the discovery. 40% of our happiness is down to our skills at being happy. That is, we can learn through practice to become happier. It's within our control. The other two areas are less within our control. This area is within our control. And Groundhog Day, my work, your work, it's all about how we can become experts in and win our gold medals in being happier. Now, the, the first aspect, so I'm familiar with the study, and I'm always interested in the first a aspect, you know, your, your set point of happiness. Mm. And um, I, I'm, I'm unaware of any research, but I'm, I'm sure if you're aware, you can share it with us. Because I can't help but think that we can still um, ritualize practices that essentially would shift our set point of happiness even because of the way that we habitually think. But I don't know whether you agree with me, so so that we can influence not just the 40%, but even the, the, the first aspect, 50%. Well, no, I, I think we can because that fixed point can, rate, can rise up. It's a level which can rise. Um, it only becomes a fixed point for life if we have, and this linking into another theory of psychology around the growth mindset, um, and that is the idea that most people have a fixed mindset. They don't believe that they can fundamentally change. They wait for things to improve or for other people to offer them better jobs. You know, they don't take responsibility for their own happiness and their own personal growth. And that's why a lot of people will stay fixed at that level. But when you apply the strategies and practices of being happier, of being more, more effective and con really committing to your personal growth, you will start to raise up your fixed point. It will start to become higher. Um, you know, there is still a reasonable amount of controversy about this idea of a fixed point, but I certainly can, and maybe you can too, think of families or siblings where you have the exact same parents, yet they have fundamentally different outlooks on the world from a very early stage in life. I know, for example, I have quite a low fixed point of happiness, and I really had to work at it, and it's one of the reasons I've dedicated a large part of my life to psychology, is to understand how I could feel better and overcome you know a lot of a lot of issues maybe from from the past or in my in my makeup but i do believe as you said if you really focus on these these what they call intentional activities of you know things like gratitude mindfulness 
helping other people, being, you know, finding meaning and purpose in your life, you will raise up your default level. Mm, and, and that was the origin of my question because I definitely think I was born with a lower set point. Mm. Um, and I don't feel any effects of a lower set point now. You know, I, I'm just uh, it con continuously and, and relatively consistently happy. And if I don't feel happy, then I know how to shift in order to become happier or calmer or, or more fulfilled. Um, now, no, Paul, I, I, I'm really keen to understand what you're working on now. So what does the, the short to medium term future look like for you in terms of your work? Well, I'm working on what is most dear to my heart at the moment, which is um, climate change and the environmental crisis that we're all facing. You know, we talked a lot about um, mindsets and shifts and happiness and calm. But the fact is, I find it difficult to be have the long-term um, optimism when I see what we're doing to our planet. And, you know, with this week, um, with what, what Trump's done repealing Obama's um, climate change reforms and really setting setting America back another 10 or 20 years, it's quite easy to feel desperate about what's happening. But, and this is the good news, is that psychology, spirituality, philosophy, the science is pointing us in a whole, towards a whole different way of living. And for me, coming back to this idea of a shift, the bigger shift we have to make is moving away from seeing our lives primarily as one of consuming, but we're here to consume as much stuff as possible to shifting towards really appreciating the miracle of life. And my favorite quotation, the quotation I look at every day, is from Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein said, there are two ways to live. You can live as if nothing is a miracle, or you can live as if everything is a miracle. My new book, my work, is all about how we can turn that into a lifestyle that's sustainable, how we can appreciate the amazing miracle of being alive, the amazing miracle of the trillions of cells in our body working together, the amazing miracle of being on Earth, which could be the only life in a lifeless universe, the amazing miracle of being born today, not a thousand years ago, mm. of being born as a human, you know, and on and on and on. We have this gift that is like winning every lottery that's ever been held on the earth, yet we treat it with disdain, disrespect. We miss it all because we're so caught up in thinking like a consumer, but we have to work harder to buy more stuff to impress more people we don't even care about a lot of the time. Mm. And we're, we're stuck in this way of living that's not making ourselves happy, but it's damaging our civilization and above all damaging our earth. So my new book is, is a self-help book about how we can live more sustainably and be happier and be healthier and be calmer and more fulfilled but in a way that's sustainable, that's good for us, other people and the planet. Mm, I completely agree. My, my values are aligned with yours on that point. And, you know, this great myth that by collecting stuff, we become happier or more important. It's, it, you know, I actually, I really, I really struggle with it. It's one of those things I have a, a, a real emotional reaction to. You shared um, Albert Einstein's quote. In fact, that, that is one of my most favorite quotes. We normally finish up the podcast by asking our guests to share a quote or a motto. Now, you've already done one, but do you have another one that you would like to share with the listeners? Well, I paraphrase the words of, of Helen Keller. She had this wonderful phrase, you know, who she overcame being being um, deaf and blind and she said that life is an adventure or nothing at all and I believe that life is an adventure but it's a greatest adventure when we really shift as I think I have from really serving ourselves to serving other people and that was how she found meaning you know somebody who had the most difficult circumstances imaginable she dedicated her life to helping other people and I, I just spend much more of my life now reading about people like Helen Keller and starting my day with positive stories so that I go into that, if you like, that miracle mindset and away from the consumer mindset. And it's making that choice at the beginning of every day that you are going to surround yourself with positive messages, inspiring messages, and don't just sink bank down to rumination into what's wrong in your life, what's missing, how life could be better, because you will never find happiness there. Mm, absolutely right. And you have very kindly agreed to give our listeners a bonus. Would you like to share what that is and where they can obtain it? Absolutely. Well, if you'd like to go to my website, which is www.paulhannam.com, um, you 
can get a free download of the introduction to my book. And it's quite a long introduction as well, which will really give you a lot of the ideas I've talked about. And also, please follow me on Twitter, because I tweet regularly. And if you're interested in the themes, the ideas I've talked about, and in my new book, I think you'll really enjoy my, my Twitter feed. And that's simply at Paul Hannum, so my name again. Luckily, I was able to get my name at an early stage for all my uh, social media properties. Paul, uh, your ideas are so aligned with the ideas at the Inside Shift and you put them in such an inspiring way. I'm very grateful for you to come for coming on to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emma. It's been an absolute privilege. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Inside Shift podcast. You can hop on to energybell.com right now to download your free copy of The True You, 